Hey there, it's Gary Parish. It's Friday, January 7, 2022. Welcome back to the CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball Podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting dodo birds and leaky black. Matt Norlander is not here with me. He's skiing in Vermont, I think. So my colleague here at CBS Sports, David Cobb, is instead joining me today. And we're going to start on what uh, is turning into arguably the greatest story in college basketball. It's the Johnny Davis show. The Wisconsin sophomore, he went big again Thursday night. He took 18 shots, made 10 of them, finished with 26 points, nine rebounds, five assists in the Badgers, 87-78 win over Iowa. He's now averaging 27.5 points and 9.8 rebounds in Big Ten games this season. David Cobb, we did a list in the preseason. Top 101 college basketball players. If I remember correctly, you rode super hard for Posh Alexander, but you ne- you never mentioned Johnny Davis even once. Neither did Deadleg, neither did Strongjaw, neither did I. This is truly an out-of-nowhere story. Three-star recruit out of high school, averaged seven points last season as a freshman. Now as a sophomore, he's averaging 22.6 points, 7.4 rebounds for a Wisconsin team that I've got ranked 10th in the top 25 and one. At this point, Johnny Davis... It looks like a first-team All-American, perhaps a National Player of the Year, and a future lottery pick in the NBA draft. I'm not sure anybody could have seen this coming. So you tell me, how wild, from your perspective, is this Johnny Davis story that we're watching unfold right now? Uh, Yeah, that's pretty wild. I mean, that that matchup last night, it wasn't just Johnny Davis, also Keegan Murray, same boat. Both those guys just role players last year for teams that were loaded with vets, Obviously, in Iowa's case, Keegan Murray was behind Luca Garza. And then, you know, with Wisconsin, they had like five seniors on that team. Johnny Davis was just a role player. So you had to be pretty plugged in. So salute to you, Gary, uh, to know that Keegan Murray and and Johnny Davis were going to be the breakout stars that they were. But I will say in our dribble handoff, Gary, I had uh, Mr. Keegan Murray listed as my uh, breakout player pick for the for the season. So, um. You know, I whiffed on Johnny Davis big time, uh, but I but I hit on Keegan Murray, and they were both spectacular last night, which turned a game between two teams that I didn't think were going to be very good this year into like a really good game between two teams that you could reasonably see making the NCAA tournament, especially in the case of Wisconsin, which as of today is four and one in in quad one games. You make a good point uh, pulling Keegan Murray into this story as well, because like you said, he was a role player last season. Um, but he did show some things in limited time. Like he was on NBA front offices, uh, you know, radar um, after last season based on, you know, he's a long forward who can guard in space. And the thought was if he could come back and show that he's an improved shooter, like he's somebody who might be able to enter the draft after his sophomore year. You saw that coming. Uh, Some NBA people saw that coming as well. I don't think anybody saw the Johnny Davis thing coming. I, I know I didn't. And well, no, but, but you could see it early. I mean, in their multi-team event, I forget which tropical destination they were in, but during that Feast Week event, you could just see the fact that he was putting that team on his shoulders. And what's crazy about his numbers is is the fact that Wisconsin typically plays at a slow pace. Right. So if you score 23 points a game, but you're, you know, you're you're playing for Arizona and you're Ben Matherin or whatever, and you get uh, you know. 35% more possessions a game, the numbers are still impressive. But in Johnny Davis's case, they're even more impressive because it's not like Wisconsin's going, you know, guns blazing, getting up and down the court and transition every every possession. So that also is what makes it stand out. It's just the, the usage rate and, and the fact that he remains efficient uh, when he's got the ball in his hands like every possession. It's interesting because there had been a thing in recruiting in recent years where – you know, it had been suggested to some five-star prospects, like you don't want to go to Wisconsin, even if you're an in-state guy, because if you're trying to flourish as an NBA prospect, you know, that's just not the place to do it. And Johnny Davis is blowing that out of the water right now because, you know, um, our, our, our buddy Sam Bassini at The Athletic, I think, has got him down, you know, going in the top five of the 2022 NBA draft. And so, again, as we sit here on January 7th, uh, it's still a lot of time, but if we were turning in, a top 101 list today, he'd be on it, and he might be at the tip top of it. For people who are unfamiliar with the specifics on him, so people who aren't Wisconsin fans probably, he was ranked 164th in the class of 2020. In-state product, 
his first offer, according to 24-7 Sports, came from Wisconsin Green Bay. Now, eventually, he did get high major offers. West Virginia offered. Marquette offered. The Iowa team he torched last night. They eventually offered, but he decided to stay in state and, and, and play with Wisconsin. His father, this is interesting to me, and I think something worth pointing out, is Mark Davis, who played collegiately at Old Dominion and then played in the NBA for the Bucks and the Suns. And so Johnny Davis is another example in what is a growing list of examples of prominent prospects whose father was a professional basketball player. I mean, you look in the NBA right now, there's Steph Curry, son of a pro, um, Clay Thompson, son of a pro, uh, Austin River, son of a pro, Demonte Sabonis, son of a pro, uh, Tim Hardaway Jr., son of a, of a pro, Jaron Jackson Jr., son of a pro, um, obviously Kobe Bryant, son of a pro. And then in college basketball right now, you've got Johnny Davis, son of a pro, um, Jabari Smith, son of a pro, A.J. Griffin, son of a pro. And I have talked um, to NBA front office people who tell me this is actually something that they value. Like, I know when the Grizzlies were evaluating Jaron Jackson Jr., one of the things they liked is that he was the son of a professional basketball player because you grow up in it and you, you get to witness. Whether you recognize you're doing it or not, you witness what it takes to play at that level. I talked to Adrian Griffin a few years ago for a story. Um, he, of course, is AJ's father because he's got an interesting deal. He, he, he has a son who was getting ready to play at Duke men's basketball and a daughter who was playing at UConn women's basketball. So he had children at like arguably the biggest men's brand and the biggest women's brand in, in college basketball. And one of the things he you know noted to me was that um, you know, AJ grew up in a gym, like he'd go to practice with me and he would, and, and then I, you know, he'd get home from school and I'd take him to the gym. And so he was just around it all the time. It's like, it shouldn't be the, I guess this is similar. It shouldn't be shocking that Charlie Woods looks awesome at golf, right? <laughs> I mean, he's just around it all the time. He can hit balls whenever he wants. He's got a simulator in his home. Uh, he, you know, his father is the best to ever do it. So I, I, I love the Charlie Wood story as much as anybody else. But again, not that surprising that he's an advanced golfer for his age, given who his father is and the way he was raised. And I really do think um, it works in basketball. Similarly, that's what front office people have told me. It's what Adrian Drif Griffin told me. And now here we got Johnny Davis, another prospect who was the son of a, of a professional you know, NBA player. Yeah, Gary, what do you think this means for uh, your little guys? Do you think it means that they could be pretty pretty good middle infielders with, with soft hands like you like you once were? They're, they're going to be average middle infielders with, with horrible arms, so really just second baseman, not shortstops. And then, uh, you know, they'll hit, uh, they'll hit a little bit. Maybe they could host a podcast someday. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? But, uh, yeah, my, my, my children are not growing up with uh, athletic advantages of – of, of maybe Johnny Davis and other people are. By the way, Johnny Davis is a twin. His brother, Jordan, also plays for Wisconsin, averages about eight minutes per game. And then, I didn't know this until I did a deep dive on Johnny Davis, he has two younger siblings, also twins. So the family is four kids, twins and twins. It's Jordan and Johnny Davis, and then they've got Maxwell and Samantha, boy-girl. So it's two boy twins, boy girl twins, but one family, four kids, two sets of twins. What an interesting deal! And what What are the uh, the athletic prospects of the younger two looking like? I mean, do you do you, do you know what they're uh, what they're into? That did not show up on the Wisconsin Johnny Davis bio page. It just noted <laughs> that, that they exist. I, I know nothing about uh, the younger Davis children other than they exist. You can really find some good stuff on those official bio pages. Yes. I was uh, looking into the Rose Bowl game the other night when the, uh, the Utah backup walk-on quarterback came in who nobody had ever heard of, looked up his official Utah bio, and it said that he was raised um, around thousands of chickens on a family farm. <laughs> and uh, I was like, hey, that's interesting. No, I, I go to anytime I'm getting ready to write or talk about a player to the extent that we're talking about Johnny Day, you know, I go to that page because you'll just see something that you didn't know. And for me, on, on, on this example, it was that there are two younger Davis twins as well. So uh, just, a, you know, I, I talked about this on Wednesday's episode with Norlander. 
uh, one of the great things about college basketball is that not every year, but often you get this out of nowhere breakout thing that that happens that nobody could have seen coming. Like you don't really have out of nowhere breakout things in the NBA. Like I think right now John Moran is the you know in the betting markets the favorite to be most improved player in the NBA. But like everybody knows who John Morant is, and everybody knew that it was possible to take a big leap in year three. Um, you don't get that in the NBA. Like, oh, my God, who is this person I've never heard of who's now maybe the best player in the NBA? Like, that doesn't happen. Yeah, but, yeah. Like, By the way, I love that you're bringing up the Grizzlies. Like, we should have just done this podcast from, like, you know, Liberty Land or, or Adventure River <laughs> or something. You know, just, just turned it into a straight-up, like, you know, Memphis podcast. Rest in peace, Liberty Land. Love Liberty Land. Love the zip and pippin'. And what was the other roller coaster at Liberty Land? Zipping, pipping, and I don't know. But my Liberty Land experiences were limited to when it was also like the Mid South Fair at course. the same you know location, and so they had all their you know like portable rides. So I, I did the Pippin, but you know most of the Liberty Land was before my time. They had Zipping Pippin, and then there was another one, and the other one went Zipping Pippin was like a wooden roller coaster, really shaky. Like the benefit of hindsight, I don't know that we should have been on that thing. <laughs> uh, the other roller coaster, God, I can't remember, but it like went upside down. That was the trick with it. Like it would go, and then you'd find yourself upside down, and it was a roller coaster. So. We just called it, you know, the Memphis basketball under under Penny Hardaway, right? <laughs> yes. And now the Memphis basketball program is is a roller coaster. It has taken the place in the city of of the Zip and Pippin. Um, with uh, with with, you know, so again, like the point was in the NBA, you're just not going to have somebody be the best, arguably the best player in that league, who you didn't maybe know existed six months ago, but you get that every once in a while in college basketball and we're getting it right now with Johnny Davis and you know you accurately pointed out this isn't like he's on like boy he's off to a nice start in the Big Ten he's been doing this all year long and that suggests there's no real reason to think it's going to slow up I don't know you know if he's going to continue to average 23 points a game or like I said in, in the Big Ten you know continue to average because it's it's way up there now, 27.5 points. Like, I don't know if he's going to be able to replicate those numbers exactly throughout the rest of this conference schedule, but he's going to be big-time scorer and a big-time player, and Wisconsin looks like a legitimate candidate to compete for the Big Ten title, and that is also something I don't think many people um, were talking about in the preseason. Before we move on to the Final Four and one, uh, real quick on the Big Ten. Did you realize that the three leading scorers in the country all play in the Big Ten? It's Keegan Murray, who is averaging 24.7 points per game at Iowa. Johnny Davis is second, 22.6 points per game at Wisconsin. And then Kofi Cobra, 22.5 points per game at Illinois. Coburn went big last night, by the way. 23 points, 18 rebounds, and a win over Maryland. Keegan Murray had 27-5 and five in that loss at Wisconsin. But this is really uncommon for high major players to dominate the national scoring race and for them to all come from the same league. And especially a league where at least the perception is that, you know, it's not some high scoring league or some, you know, get up and down basketball league, but the three leading scorers in America at the division one level at this moment, all play in the big 10. Yeah. And I went over and looked at the Ken Palm player of the year rankings. So, Keegan Murray is sixth. Johnny Davis is fifth. Kofi Coburn is second. Then EJ Liddell at Ohio State is one. Trace Jackson Davis at Indiana is four. And Zach Eady at Purdue is seven. Six of the top seven Ken Palm Player of the Year candidates right now call the Big Ten home. So I think the Big 12, from a numbers perspective, is considered the best conference in college basketball. But this suggests the Big Ten might have the best players. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, the Big Ten, I don't think from a team perspective, is as deep as we at least thought it was last year going into the NCAA tournament. But the the top-tier talent in that league is second to none. I mean, and you, the list goes on. I don't know if you mentioned or if Ken Palm had in his top seven, you know, Jaden Ivey, Hunter Dickinson. Um, Jamison Battle is putting up ridiculous numbers. I mean, Alfonso Plummer has stepped up for Illinois and is shooting 40% from three-point range with Curbelo out. I mean – you know, the, the the amount of stars in that league, and you know, not to mention guys like Ron Harper who don't put up crazy numbers but are just like total alphas leading their teams. There's just on any given night, I mean, 
there's only a couple of teams in the league that I would say don't have like a clear cut star. Uh, Michigan State comes to mind as one that that fits in that category, but nearly everybody else in the Big Ten has like an elite, like top twenty five caliber player in the sport. Uh, on their roster. So it's, it's fun to watch because on a given night, you got Johnny Davis against Jaden Ivy. And, yeah. you know, all of a sudden we're talking about both those guys as potential lottery picks and uh, stuff. So it's, it's, uh, it's been, it's been good to watch, but it's been fun last night. You mentioned Kofi. Uh, so when I did my um, off season transfer rankings and I'm going to do a refresh of that next week, um, I had Kudus Wahab in the top 10. And the reason for that was because he was going to fill a position of need at Maryland. Maryland didn't have a true center last season. They ended up playing, you know, Dante Scott down low and stuff like that. And so I thought Wahab should be, you know, a top 10 transfer in the sport due to the fact that he was, you know, improving his productivity at Georgetown was coming in to play a position of need. But that poor guy, he got, he got worked by, by Kofi last night. I mean, he fouled out in 10 minutes. He played 10 minutes and he fouled out without scoring a point. So, I mean, that just, I'm not picking on, on Wahab. I'm just using that to illustrate the fact that Kofi Coburn is not only, you know, playing at a high level, but just, I think far exceeding uh, what was reasonable to even expect of him because he's improved on his numbers from last year in a pretty significant way. Um, And I think really uh, turning Illinois from a disappointment into a team that all of a sudden is looking really, really dang good. So uh, salute to uh to, to Kofi there that was an impressive performance last night he's been terrific you know uh, like we said third in the nation in scoring 22.5 but also like 12 and a half rebounds per game he's just so big and strong and violent like he's just very hard for other college basketball players to deal with it, you know think of some of the others and I'm not comparing to any of these people but like people who just like this person does not belong in college basketball, right? And it's weird because he's not necessarily the greatest NBA prospect because of the way that game is played at that level right now. But he's overwhelming for, uh, you know, the high major level. Like, he's very difficult to deal with. In fact, when we did the Candy Coaches series, Norlander and I, um, in the preseason, when we were asking coaches who's the best player in college basketball, who will be the best player in college basketball. Once again, nobody said Johnny Davis, but a lot of people did say Kofi Coburn. And we had at least one Big Ten coach say, I'm just telling you, he's the toughest one for us. We don't know. We we have a hard time dealing with that guy because he is so big and so strong and so aggressive that – you really can't guard him one on one. Yeah, and yeah, and and if Plummer and his his perimeter guys are shooting forty percent right. from three, you can't double down on him. He's just going to kick out and, and and splash, you know. So, uh, th- here's the thing with Illinois: they're going to be back in the AP poll next week. They were the the first team out in terms of like receiving votes this this past week. They'll be in on Monday because they don't play on Saturday, uh, so it's not like they run the list risk of losing a game. And uh, the fact is, of their three losses, uh, one of them came when Kofi was serving that stupid suspension that that the NCAA handed down this offseason. The second one was in his first game back, which, like, you kind of forgive that to a certain extent. And then, really, the only one that you look at and say, okay, that was, like, full-strength Illinois or close to it because they still didn't have Andre Curbelo, um, but it was a four-point uh, home loss to, to Arizona, and Arizona's playing as well as anybody in the country. So, so Illinois is back. I mean, I think that's the, my takeaway from from last night's action is that they are they're back. Yeah, they're sitting here at eleven and three. You just explained the context of the record. They are literally my first team out of the top twenty-five and one right now. I just need somebody to lose that is in that range that can be bounced out. Um, the the most likely candidate this weekend, and we'll get to this in a moment, is probably Colorado State because they're like you know in that you know they're undefeated, but the record uh, you know the resume is it's you know it, it you know, they can only play who they play and they beat them all, but there's not a lot there. And going to San Diego State is is obviously difficult. They're an underdog there, so that might be the development that happens over the weekend. Colorado State plays well, but takes a understandable loss at San Diego State. You can then. Um, you know, reasonably remove them and then Illinois slides right in. But I do think you're right. Illinois will be um, ranked in the top 25 of the AP poll on Monday, regardless of what happens this weekend, one way or another. So the Big Ten, just terrific. We talked about it in the preseason as a league that was going to have, you know, multiple national championship contenders. And I think that's still true. But I don't think we recognized it as a league that's going to have multiple national player of the year candidates, multiple 
possible first team All Americans. But uh, again, as we sit here on January seventh, that is absolutely where we're at. All right, let's get to the final four and one. Nada, are you there? Can you please update us on everybody's record? I feel like I'm surging. I feel like I'm surging right now. Technically, you are surging, GP. You have won three. You won three games last week. You're that? now up to eleven and sixteen. Norlander had a bad week last week and is now nine, 19 and 13. And our friend David Cobb in his one week is three and one. So therefore, you're doing pretty well. Again, you're doing pretty well for yourself right now, GP. I got off to a rough start, but now I'm surging. I'm like the Illinois of the Ion College basketball podcast. I got off to a rough start, but but now I'm surging. I'm, I'm, I'm picking better these days. Hey, hey real right. quick about that, my, my previous appearance, Gary, I wanted to let you know, um, I don't know if you've heard this or if it's been discussed, you know, with our bosses, but Matt did not give shouts to Devin Downey or Chester, South Carolina, or Leaky Black whenever I filled in for you when you were out with your with your wisdom teeth. That's disrespectful. It is. Yeah, I mean, this is. But, a- but I will let you know, I, um, I I put on for Baylor in that podcast and for the Drew family. <laughs> So I made fun of you for for being bald a little bit, but then I also I also um, you know picked up the slack and, and really uh, waved the flag for the Drew family as well. And I don't want I'd, I'd, you know I don't I prefer not to be bald, but like um, I had to make a decision. And by the way, I saw something in the comments last episode saying why is GP always got a hat of cocked up like whatever. Um, honestly, this is just the way I wear, I wear a hat uh, for better or worse. But somebody suggested he's trying to cover up his bald spot. I don't have a bald spot. I have a bald head. I had a bald spot. <laughs> which is why I decided to go bald head. I just said, I don't want to have a bald spot. That's outrageous. So I'd rather have a bald head. I, I, I fundamentally think you're better off with a bald head than a bald spot. Yeah, it's and I like, I like the hat thing too. It, seeing you guys you know, wear the hats on the pod kind of gave me the, the confidence to do the same today. So I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm waiting to get that email where they say, all right, uh, we, I know we told you to dress casually and we didn't care what you wear, but um, we didn't think you were going to ha- wear a hat backwards every single time. Maybe you, maybe, maybe it's time to start caring how you dress on the podcast. We ain't got it yet, but, but, but I mean, any day now, any day now. So, um, all right. I got four games. You get to pick the fifth. We'll talk about them, at least my four, in the order in which they will tip off. Game one, Saturday, 2.30 p.m. Eastern. Number 10, Michigan State at Michigan inside the Trey Burke Center. Kim Palm has it Michigan minus two. You can watch it on Fox. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, simple as not overthinking it for me in this one. The fact is Michigan's playing awful. Michigan State's playing really well. I know the game is is at Michigan, so, you know, they get a little bit of a bump for that. But, I mean, this Michigan defense is not playing very well. They're, they were top five, top ten Ken Palm last year in defensive efficiency, and they're way, way down on the list this year. So, I mean, I'm just going simple as the fact that, that Michigan State's starting to play well. Max Christie's starting to figure it out. You know, I'm going uh, I'm going Michigan Michigan State here to, to win and cover. I'm with you. Like, I, I've just sort of reached the point Michigan's not good. You know, they still got some strong computer numbers at Ken Palm, but that's because the preseason stuff is still in there. This is a team that's seven and six after Tuesday's loss at Rutgers. They were six in the preseason AP poll, and they probably won't sniff that again. And it's pretty clear what has happened. Um, we, and I include myself in this, um, underestimated what they lost. They lost a lot off that team. Isaiah Livers, Franz Wagner, Mike Smith, Shondi Brown, Austin Davis. They lost five of their top seven. And I guess most of us, including myself, thought, yeah, but they they bring back Hunter Dickinson, Eli Brooks. They enrolled a top three recruiting class, two five stars, Caleb Houston, uh, Musa Diabate. But, you know, the, the five stars haven't been great. Um, you know, Houston is shooting 36.4% from the field, 31.3% uh, from three. Debate's only playing 20.8 minutes per game. And so they lost a whole lot. And the pieces we thought were going to make up for that just haven't made up for that, haven't even come close. And then Dickinson, you know, where Jaden Ivey has taken a leap in the Big Ten and – Obviously, Johnny Davis has taken a leap in the Big Ten. Hunter Dickinson really hasn't. He's just, you know, he's a good college basketball player, but he hasn't taken a, any sort of notable leap. So they're just, they're not good. This feels like a wrong team favorite situation to me. Michigan State is good. 13-2 and two now. 
wins over Loyola, Chicago, UConn, Louisville, Penn State, Minnesota. The only losses are to Baylor and Kansas. They've won eight straight games. I've got them ranked six in the top 25 and one right now. And you mentioned Michigan State earlier as a team that maybe doesn't have a star. And I agree. Like, they don't have anybody competing for a, star, uh, a, a scoring title. But Gabe Brown has taken a leap in in this season not a johnny davis leap but he averaged 7.2 points per game last season he's now up to a team high 14.5 points per game and he's averaging 19.3 in michigan state's past three games what's interesting about this spartans team they shoot it really well from three which is not like something we normally talk about with michigan state basketball 39.3 percent from three as a team that ranks ninth nationally i mean Listen, home court advantage in college basketball, especially in a rivalry game, that that that's always something to consider. And I'll consider it, but I think this is just one team's good and one team's not. And Michigan yeah. State's the good one. I'll I'll take them to win on the road. Yeah. Game two. <laughs> yep. Game two Saturday, four p.m. Eastern. Number six Kansas at number twenty-five Texas Tech inside Pat Knight Arena. Kim Palm has it Kansas minus two. You can watch it on ESPN two. What do you think? Yeah, uh, going KU here, which feels easy, but to me it's just a, a fact of the uncertainty surrounding Texas Tech. I mean, they were down to seven scholarship players when they went on the road to, to Iowa State earlier this week. Uh, not sure exactly what their status is with all the, the COVID uh, you know, outs and all that, but uh, even if they are back in a better position COVID-wise, uh, Kevin McCuller I think is still questionable or day-to-day -day, um, entering that game, which is – no, not ideal. So uh, going Kansas here, the yo-yo with David McCormick is, is a little bit infuriating, <laughs> but, but if good David McCormick, McCormick uh, shows up, um, I don't know that, that Texas Tech will have an answer for that. So I think I like Kansas here. Starts the first, I think, 11 games of the season, McCormick. Um, he just, whatever, uh, frustrating, probably the best way to describe him. And then Bill moves him to the bench. Uh, in Tuesday's game against Oklahoma State, comes off the bench, 17 points, 15 rebounds, absolute monster. We'll see what we get from him uh, this weekend. Um, Texas Tech's interesting, and they were obviously shorthanded at Iowa State, but even beyond that, they haven't done a lot this season. You know, they're one in three in quadrant one opportunities. 80% of their wins have come in quadrant four games. Um, Nine of their 10 victories are against teams that are ranked outside of the top 190 at Ken Palm. So, like, there's not a lot of substance there. They won that ugly, ugly game against Tennessee. But outside of that, there's nothing. They're down to 26 in the net, um, 20, you know, late, you know, late 20s at Bart Torvik when you remove the preseason biases. Um, their strength of record ranks 33rd nationally. So I've dropped The defense them. is legit. The defense is legit. Of course. And and that was the one thing you you would assume. Like if you said, hey, what can you trust about Texas Tech coming into the season with Mark Adams? You say, well, they're going to guard. And they, they do guard. The defense is legit. But, you know, in this sport, typically you got to score. And um, I, I don't know. Like I'm not out on Texas Tech. I'm just saying, you know, there, there's not a lot of substance to what they've done so far this season. But like I wrote in the lead to the top 25 and one on Thursday morning, hey, you could, you could change that real quick over the next couple of games because you got, you got Kansas at your place and then you go to Baylor. And if you split those, I think you feel pretty good about it, maybe great about it. If you lose both of them, you're 0-3 in the Big 12. And it doesn't mean you can't dig out of it. Some of this is schedule-induced. When you got to start at Iowa State, Kansas, at Baylor, that's a tough way to start, even if you didn't think it would be um, when you got the schedule in the offseason because Iowa State is probably the biggest surprise in college basketball. But I I'm real interested in watching this game to see what Texas Tech is because, again, um, they're ranked everywhere. Computer numbers kind of strong, but there's not a lot of substance to the win-loss record at this point. I will take Kansas to win this game and cover that number. Saturday, this is game three, 4 p.m. Eastern, number 20, Colorado State at San Diego State inside Malachi Flynn Arena. Ken Palm has it San Diego State minus four. You can watch it on CBS. That's America's most watched network. It is the network of stars. Can Colorado State stay undefeated? Uh, yeah, I'm actually going San Diego State here. Uh, just uh, an, an elite 
defensive team that the Aztecs have. So Colorado State, as you have alluded to earlier on the pod, uh, hasn't really been tested a whole lot, and that's not all their own fault. I mean, they had an Alabama game wiped out, so it's it's been a, a tough situation for them with COVID. But, um, you know, they haven't really been tested against a defense nearly as good as, as this one that, that San Diego State's going to bring into this matchup. So, um, yeah, the Rams are shooting, what, you know, 42% from three-point range, which is, I think, fourth in the nation. At least it was as of yesterday when I was working on uh, the the pre- pre- predictions post for for CBS Sports. Um, I just don't think that San Diego State's going to allow them to uh, to get you know clean looks. Um, San Diego State has held you know most of its opponents below sixty points this season, so it's it's just a, a tough matchup. And to me, the, the 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 deciding factor is the fact that it's at San Diego State, so right. it's a home environment for the Aztecs. I think they get it done. I think Colorado State might be the better team. Like you put these two on a neutral court, um, I think Colorado State might slightly be the better team. But uh, you know, going on the road at San Diego State—that's a—that's a—I mean, that's a tough deal. You're asking your team, and I'm not saying they can't do it, but you know, Nico is asking his team to go win a game, unlike any game they've won so far this season. They have been good though. No, no, like big signature wins, but they beat St. Mary's, they beat Mississippi State. They beat Creighton, um, but it is zero wins over top 30 Kempom teams and just one quad, one win. That's that neutral court win over Ben Howland's Bulldogs. They've got Colorado State, a top 20 offense. Um, they barely turn it over at all. So yeah, yeah. Hey, quick yeah. point. Isaiah Stevens actually leads the nation in assist to turnover ratio, or right. at least he did as of yesterday. So, right. I mean, I'm open to being wrong about this yeah. one, Like, I, and I won't be disappointed if I am because Colorado State could be a really fun team. It's just, I mean, you're going to lose games during the course of the season. This seems like a logical place for them to pick up an L. Yeah, like if you're going to if you're going to take an L, this is the probably most likely place in conference where you're going to do it. But um, you know, they they do have a top 20 offense. They don't turn it over. Like you noted, they shoot incredibly well from 3. They can win. I just don't know that they will win. Uh shaky on the defensive side of the ball. I think 101st at Kenpom in adjusted defensive efficiency. Um but they've got a player who is fabulous. I don't know how many casual college basketball fans fans have put um their eyes on him. But David Roddy is a 6'5 junior, averaging 19.7 points, uh, 8.1 rebounds per game. He's like an undersized front court player. I love in college basketball. I like love under. And I mean, I don't know that I'd design a team with them, but in terms of just like watching them, I love undersized, uh, undersized front court players who just wreck people. You know, um, elbow in. And Roddy is obviously capable of doing that. He's a fabulous college basketball player. Yeah, 6'5", 250. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love it. Um, so he's terrific. San Diego State will have its hands filled uh, with him. But, you know, this Aztecs team, I know they're not the favorite in the Mountain West, but don't forget they won back-to-back Mountain West Conference titles. Um, you know, they've, they've beaten St. Mary's this year. They've got a top-10 defense. But they are just one in three in quadrant one opportunities. So I guess – Forced to pick it, I'll take Colorado State plus the points because it's four, according to Ken Bob. So I'll take Colorado State plus the four, but you know, I, I, I think San Diego State probably wins a close game here. Either way, again, it's going to be 4 p.m. Eastern. You can watch it on CBS. It's America's Most Watched Network. It's a network of stars. Game four, Saturday, 6 p.m. Eastern, number 18, Tennessee, at number 21, LSU, Inside the strong ass offer assembly center, Ken Palm has it LSU minus four. You can watch it on ESPN two. Yeah, gotta go LSU because this Tennessee offense is is in a bad type of way right now. What is going on with that? Like they they they're playing shorthanded Ole Miss the other night, and they got two points in the first two minutes of the game, yeah. and then you know we we referenced the. Uh, awful performance offensively against Texas Tech. Like, what? why? They've got a pro point guard and veteran, you know, uh, starters all over the court, and they can't score. That, or at least often. They find themselves in situations where they can't score. It's been the exact opposite of what I expected from this Tennessee team because they lost from last year's team, which was a really good defensive team last year and a really poor offensive team. 
They lost Eves Ponds, who was a versatile shot blocking machine. And then they lost Keon Johnson and Jaden Springer, who were more effective defensively for that team due to their athleticism, versatility, disruptive in terms of getting steals and, and so on. They lost those three players who I think most folks would have told you were their best three defensive players. And they replaced them with the likes of Kennedy Chandler and Justin Powell and Brandon Huntley Hatfield uh, and players who you assumed would be really, uh, really help them offensively, but it's just been more of the same. So in, in one respect, you have to give credit for Tennessee and to Rick Barnes for maintaining that high level of defensive efficiency but on the flip side of it, they have tried to become this team that shoots a bunch of threes um, and can slow it down or speed you up or, or what have you. But it's it, it really hasn't worked. Uh, I think the lone notable exception to that would be their performance against Arizona, where they did play fast. They matched Arizona's tempo. They did it quite successfully because their defense was so disruptive. But in this environment against LSU, you're talking as of right now, LSU having the number one ranked defense at Ken Palm. And you're talking about Tennessee being on the road. And I just think that's a, a tough situation because uh, LSU is, you know, credit to, to Will Wade. He's he's replaced his, you know, top three players from last season with a bunch of guys from his last two classes who were not necessarily like, oh, all out five star, like the types of players who we would associate Will Wade with uh, making offers to, you know. Um, and he's turned a bunch of guys who are like, you know, in the range of 50 to 100 in the recruiting rankings into like a really good team. So um, I just don't think that Tennessee's offense being the way that it is, is equipped to go on the road right now and, and beat the team with the number one ranked defense in the country. Yeah, I'm with you. I mean, I don't want to oversimplify it, but if you're having problems scoring against shorthanded Ole Miss at home, you know, good luck scoring, you know, at LSU, this is a game, you know, between the two best defenses in the country, according to Ken Palm. Um, but one of them is going to be at home and one of them, um, you know, is is rolling right now. They're thirteen and one. LSU is the lone loss is to, is at Auburn, and I know that got away from them a little bit. But you know, Auburn looks like a national championship contender. So, yeah, I mean, it's just hard to you know, it, looking back on it, it's wild to think like, how did Tennessee go score seventy seven and beat Arizona, uh, given the way that offense has looked in other spots this year, but. I don't know. Maybe it's recency bias, but I can't watch what I watched the other night and think that, that team's going to go to LSU and win. Um, I'm skeptical they'll be competitive. So, yeah, I'll lay the points. I'm with you. I'm going to lay the points uh, with, with LSU in this one. All right, game five. You get to pick it. The floor is yours. Okay, GP, we are going uh, Miami at number two Duke. It's uh, Duke minus 15 per uh, Ken Palm, and I have a – Trivia time. Oh, trivia you. time. Okay, let's go. Yes. Okay, Gary. Uh, when was the last time mm. that Miami started 4-0 and in ACC play? God. They are 4-0 and right now. That's why I'm asking. The last time Miami started 4-0 and in ACC play. Because Miami has won eight straight games. And those ACC games are Clemson, Wake, Syracuse, NC State. I don't. I, Miami started four zero in two thousand eleven. Ooh, you're in the in the neighborhood. Uh, so it was the twenty twelve thirteen season. So was that Shane Larkin? Uh, yeah, yeah, he was their leading scorer. Yeah. Um, so that I believe that was year two under Jim Laranega. So they started four uh, zero. They actually ended up starting thirteen and zero in the ACC. Uh, finished twenty nine and seven. Uh, won the ACC tournament, and then were a number two seed in the NCAA tournament. They eventually got bounced by uh, Marquette. Uh, but there's a fun fact for you. Uh, it, I think I might It was like 50 years before. So, I mean, it's not very – it doesn't happen very often, I would say. I think I might have been in, at, at Miami for a game that season. Um, I went – it was Miami-Duke. I'm looking at it now. I, I think I was there January of 2013. Um Miami blew out Duke 90 63. I'm pretty sure I was at that game. LeBron and maybe D Wade were there. I remember the game I was at. It was Miami Duke. Maybe it was Miami, North Carolina. I think it was. No, I think it was this one. And um, LeBron and D Wade were there. It was January. And I just remember I wildly underestimated the weather in Miami because, like, it was January. I got on a plane and I had stuff that you typically wear in January. 
And I remember having to wake up the morning of the game and go shopping because I was sweating everywhere I was going. I, 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 I had to get a short sleeve something because it was uh, it was it was not cold. In my, shockingly, it was not cold in Miami. And that's uh, that that is also the day I uh, realized that if I'd have thought it through a little bit better, I should have gone to college at Miami. I don't know why more people I know some do. But why more people don't take weather into account when picking a college? Like, I swear, if I if I could if I would go back and do it all over again, and I'd love to go back and do it all over again. I feel like I, I feel like I could do it better. Um, Gary, I, you know who did take weather into consideration when making their college choice? Hmm. Willie Harrington's grandson went to where? Miami. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> like that's like if I, I, I I've said this for a while. Like if I could go back. Like once my career had me bouncing all over the country um, and, and getting to see places and go to places I'd never been before, I said, you know, if I could do it again, I would pick my college based on weather. Like if I could get in, I don't even know if I get in these places, but like if I could get into UCLA, I'd go to UCLA. If I could get in, you know, I'd go to Miami. I would pick a school based on how awesome it feels every day. I just think it changes your mood when it just is awesome every day. Like I spent a long time ago, I was doing a television show with the great Allie LaForce, who has gone on to bigger and brighter things. And so it was me and Allie doing a television show for like two weeks straight out in LA, um, or at least in Southern California, that part of the country. So I was in Southern California. I've been to LA a million times, but I've never spent like two straight weeks there. And it like changed my mood just waking up every day and walking outside it was just like it actually i was like i get why people overpay to live here yeah. because it's just it feels great every day like you know how it is where um you know in this in, in this part of the country like there'll be that one day in the spring where you're out playing golf and you're like my god this is amazing can you believe how great this feels one day you get one day of that and then the rest of the summer, it's miserable. Like, you you don't even know why. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've been on the golf course in July. And we're looking at each other, and we're like, why are we out here? This is miserable. It is so hot and so sticky and so just, ugh. And yet, in L.A., you never get that. In L.A., it's it's basically perfect every day. Yeah, and I don't know how Norlander does it. I mean, living up there where he does, I mean, I just have a pity on his soul. I mean, and, and as somebody as a native of the South – College basketball, in my opinion, and in the NBA as well, the lone redeeming qualities of winter. I mean, honestly, without without basketball, I mean, the seasonal depression would be in full swing. Well, man, I, like I've, you know, in the winter, been to some of these places. Like, I remember I was in East Lansing one night in January for Michigan State, whatever game. And after the game, you know how it is. You're leaving an arena. You walk out of a door and then you, you go to the media lot. If that's where you're parked and you usually are. And. At Michigan State, I walked out, and I should have gone left to go to the media lot, confused. I went right, at which point I find myself walking around the entire Breslin Center, and it's so cold. Like, it's a diff- like yesterday, here in Memphis, it was cold. It was cold. That just meant, like, you know, you put a coat on because it's cold, but it wasn't painful. In East Lansing, I swear, I thought my face was about to yeah. break or something so, was wrong. I felt like something was wrong. Like, I wasn't just cold because I remember I, when I finally found my car, I was going to meet some people for like late night, you know, grab a bite, grab a drink type thing. And I got there and um, they're like, you OK? And I was like, I'm hurting. Like, I, I didn't know. I didn't know you're supposed to be hurt from cold. Like, I thought you're supposed to just be cold. Like, I'm uncomfortable because I'm cold. I'm not just cold. I'm in pain. And you don't get that. You, you don't get that at Miami. That's my point. No, okay. So real quick, before we actually pick the Duke Miami game, uh, your stories about going up north covering basketball remind me when I was on the Grizzlies beat, the first month that I was on the Grizzlies beat, the Grizzlies played at Minnesota twice. And yeah. this was January. All right. So uh, I had to go up there for one. It's really difficult to get there as somebody who often publicizes your flight woes. You can appreciate the fact that Memphis doesn't fly direct to Minneapolis except for like once a week. And of course it wasn't convenient to when the Grizzlies were playing there. So I'm already connecting through Chicago or something and going up to Minneapolis. It's an arduous trip. 
get up there and it's literally like, you know, negative 21 degrees, which is something I have never experienced before. And as somebody who was not told in advance of the skywalk system where you can walk between the buildings downtown, you know, I'm like legitimately afraid that, you know, the half mile walk from my hotel to target center is going to result in frostbite. Um, yeah, it's just, yeah. Anyway, we're, we're exposing our, our Southern, Southernness here, but it, yeah, like, but I like, like I, I hear like Norlander, I'll be texting with him every once in a while. And he'll say, yeah, I got to go out and shovel snow. Like I've never shoveled snow in my life. Like if snow gets on my driveway, it I'm just going to assume it'll be gone in a couple of days. It's fine. But like, these people have to shovel snow. That's outrageous to me to have to wake up and go do that. I would never want to do that. I mean, I don't even put together my kids' Christmas toys. There's no way I'm shoveling snow. (laughs) You got a guy for that. I can't get a guy for that. There's no outrageous to be out there shoveling snow. Wait, like imagine wake up. The first thing you got to go do is shovel snow. Like I want to wake up, get a cup of coffee and watch some big bank challenges and do the top 25 and one. I ain't trying to try to shovel snow. You crazy. Like there's a lot of advantages to living, you know, up North, but that snow and ice stuff and, and, you know, freezing to death. That ain't one of them. That's a, that's, a, that's in the negative column. Well, as it pertains to our pick, the game is being played at Duke. So, so uh, the, the blue devils will have the, uh, the, the, the home court advantage. Miami won't get to, uh, won't get to enjoy the uh, the nice weather of of its campus. So um, I'm I'm going Duke minus 15. And because I mean, let's be real, we're talking about a, a Miami team here that is 4-0 in league play. But Gary, they are 213th in defensive efficiency at Ken Palm. 213th. That's not good. It's not. It's I'm not. Smiling. So I think I think Duke's going to score a lot of points. And the fact is, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's great that Miami's off to a 4-0 start. It's another situation where you'd love to see the underdog continue to thrive. But there are four victories to this point. You mentioned the, the teams earlier, Clemson, NC State, Wake Forest, and Syracuse. All those wins are by, by single digits. So it's not like they're you know out here blowing people away. Uh, teams are scoring on them pretty easy. Uh, they've got some really good guards that are fun to watch, but I think I think Duke wins this one pretty easily. Another thing to note about Miami's 4-0 ACC record – Four home games, which is unusual. You don't usually get to start conference play with four home games, but um, the 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 four wins are are all uh, in Coral Gables. Um, this is obviously going to be uh, inside Cameron Indoor. I think Duke wins the game, obviously, but that's a big number, like fifteen points. I'll take I'll take the points in Miami, um, but but Duke wins the game. You know. Nine to thirteen points somewhere in in that range. All right, we got that done. Hey, I appreciate you being here. Yeah, man, it was a, it was a good time. You know, uh, I wish I could have gotten a few more jabs in at Norlander. Um, he seems like the type of guy who might take that personally, though. So, so we'll just we'll just let him be. He can roll with the punches. I think there's going to be uh, time later this month. I think where uh, I'm taking a little weekend getaway. And so you might get roped back into this thing uh, uh, at least one more time and, and perhaps two, depending on uh, scheduling plans. I'm, I'm so I'm nervous. Like we have already made plans um, to, to go on a trip for my birthday. And um, I'm just nervous that I'm going to pop positive like two days before it in New York. And rather than fly where we're flying, um, get stuck in New York for 10 days. But, uh, you know, that's the that's the world we're all living in now. So. We'll just do our best and try to get through it. Fingers crossed. It's the dumbest pandemic of your life is what I heard. It's not even close. I mean, it used to, people would try to debate me and it's clear. Nobody's even arguing anymore. The dumb, it's just so dumb. It's just dumb, 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 dumb. I've, I've had, I've tested negative six times in the past week, but have had close contacts with at least five different people who have tested positive like somebody i worked with the person who drove me to the airport on monday tested positive yesterday uh somebody i worked with on tuesday tested positive on wednesday my little guy uh, tested positive on monday um you know one of our neighbors our kids bounce back and forth to each other's houses all the time tested positive on sunday and um, 
then somebody else who's in our home all the time tested positive on Monday. And so, like, they put me through. I was getting tested. It felt like every 45 minutes in New York. Like, before you before you come back, go test again. And I've been – I don't know how I've been negative every time. Yo, your I, vaccine's doing his, doing his thing, man. I'm just I, – I, I, you know, I'm vaccine is helping, obviously. And then, you know, um, I might just be too elusive. I might just be too evasive uh, for uh, for this variant. Or more likely, and this is what my wife thinks, um, I got it around Christmas because I've had symptoms for two weeks. And I got it around Christmas, and it was out of my system before I started testing so rigorously. And so that's why it's the negatives are coming up. Who, who knows? Who could tell? The fact that nobody knows is is among the reasons of the dumbest pandemic of my lifetime. Not even close. Shouts to Devin Downey. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Patrick Hunter. He's a legend. Shouts to Lauren now. Thank you guys once again for listening to Ion College Basketball Podcast in the middle of the whoo, dumbest pandemic of my lifetime if you're not subscribed please go subscribe anywhere you subscribe to podcasts including apple Podcasts and spotify you can leave five star reviews at both of those places that would be great um write some nice words over at apple Podcasts, and please go if you haven't already subscribe to the youtube channel that's important we're doing these things live now on youtube every sunday wednesday friday so go subscribe and you can uh, you know, hit the bell button so that you get alerts, let you know when a new video drops. And while you're there, smash that like button. Nice rhythm. Smash the like button. Brandon Davies would do it. You have consent. Brandon Davies would do it. So please go do that. And we're going to talk to you again on Sunday night. Till then, take care. <laughs>